tonight. Bandits kill 11 persons in a fresh attack on Zangal Kataf local government area of Kaduna State. One soldier killed, two critically injured from an ambush by gunmen on a team of soldiers at the boundary between Asari Toru and Emoa local government areas of River State. Federal government assures that the recent designation of bandits as terrorists is to end the insecurity challenge in the country. British Foreign Secretary Liz Truss says British troops will not be deployed to fight in any conflict in spite of real threats of Russia invading Ukraine. And Rafael Nadal wins a record 21st Grand Slam, fighting back from two sets down to beat Russia's Daniel Medvedev in a classic Australian Open final. We begin with security and in Kermin Masara community in Zago Kataf, local government area of Kaduna State, which has been thrown into mourning after 11 people were killed during an attack by suspected bandits in the early hours of today. The attackers reportedly stormed the community while the residents were still asleep and started shooting sporadically. They then set houses ablaze. One of the 11 victims is an old blind woman who was reportedly burnt to death inside her room. Over 30 houses and properties were also burnt in the attack, while many residents have fled from the community for fear of being attacked. The latest incident comes barely four days after the Kaduna state government held a peace-building meeting between leaders of the Fulani, Hausa and Atiyap communities in Kauru and Zango Kataf local government areas during which all stakeholders agreed to sheath their swords and embrace peace. Still on security, a soldier has been killed and two other officers critically injured after an attack by gunmen at the boundary town between Asari Toru and Amohua local government areas of River State. Although the Army Division is yet to comment on the issue, the incident was confirmed to Channel's television by the chairman of Akukutoru local government area, Mr. Roland Sekibo. The incident happened this early morning at uh, a place we call the Iron Core, the bridge that links uh, Emoa to the Calabari area. That was where something happened. No soldier was uh, adopted from the information because I'm just leaving the, 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 the scene. I just got back home. This morning was in outside. No soldier was adopted. What happened was the lead ambush on one of the soldiers and attacked the soldiers. Unfortunately, the damage lost one person, and, but two of, it, two of them were seriously, seriously injured. In spite of the security challenges confronting the country, the federal government is assuring that the recent classification of bandits as terrorists is to enable security agencies carry out more stringent measures in the fight against terrorists. That's according to the country's vice president, Professor Yemi Oshibajo, who was speaking at the palace of the Emir of Katsina during a condolence visit to the state following the death of the mother of the founder of Max Air, Dahiru Barao Mangao. Bandits should be classified as terrorists. This is to enable security agencies to take more stringent action against them. So we expect to see significant changes and we expect to see this. By the grace of God, their peace will return completely to all our villages and communities in this state and all across the country. This, as you know, is the president's desire. This is what you want to see happen. And I'm sure that with all the measures, the new measures that we have ordered as such as that are now taking place, we should be able to see a very significant change in the security situation in the country. Staying with security still, without the introduction of community policing in Nigeria, he will continue to face security challenges. The view of the former deputy national chairman of the People's Democratic Party, Chief Olabode George. Chief George told Channel Television's Ladi Akudulale on our current affairs program, Newsnight, that arguments around affordability by states do not stand scrutiny and that providing adequate security is a way for state governors to actually be the chief security officers that they are called. 
We are not reinventing the wheel. You know, when people say, oh, if you don't pay them, if the governor knows for sure that the security people have not been paid, what is the first job of anybody in government? Protection of lives and properties. That's the, the number one job. If you can't do that, then you are not fit to be the governor of that state. So having them, maybe some states will have more because they can afford it. Maybe you will have a smaller you know, number. number. The beauty of it, the effective uh, outcome of that is the fact that because policing is community-based, you are sure you'll be able to contain your local governments, the people, their lives and properties day and night. And there will be people who will be hired with, within that community. So they know who lives here, who does this. And if you see a stranger in the night coming to that community, you have the right to challenge. Hey, who is this man? Which house do you want to go? Are you visiting or you are just going by and all that? They know everybody in the house. There's nothing much better in terms of policy than that. And if you can't do that, what are you doing in government? So they need these men to start. Right now, there's a moteku which was uh, created. Undo State has its own. Ekiti has its own. Osho, 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 Ogun. Only Lagos said no. The only financially buoyant state, far out of all these six, is Lagos. He said, I don't want to do it. I said, what? So when they had this crisis in uh, say this place on the mainland, uh, the one, the most recent one, yeah. that's the uh, Shangisha, Shangisha, the Magodo crisis. Okay. Guy. Yes, Magodo. The Magodo side. I mean, should there be a need for such? No. The chief security officer, in fact, physically went there. And they told him, you know, you cannot pass here. In his state, you know? So why are we thinking that the only way we can provide security for lives and properties is by running only the federal police? It's not working. You can watch the full interview with Chief George on Newsnight as tomorrow, Monday, January 31st, 2022, right here on Channel Television at 9 p.m. Meanwhile, officers and men of the Nigeria police may be eagerly looking forward to receiving the 20% salary increment approved for them by the federal government last year. But the issue of insufficient pay is just one of the many challenges the personnel are faced with in the performance of their duties. However, the chairman of the Police Service Commission says reforms are underway to ensure improved welfare packages for men of the uniform, which are key in service delivery. Our next report takes a look at the welfare of the Nigeria police. Doctor! The Nigeria police, the principal law enforcement agency, saddled with the task of maintaining law and order in the society. First established in the 18th century, the force grew to an about 1,200 member armed personnel 50 years after. Currently, it has a staff strength of 371,800 deployed across the 36 states of the country and the federal capital territory, with plans to increase the number to 650,000 with an annual recruitment of 10,000 personnel. However, a major challenge to keeping these officers and men in top form is the issue of welfare and this borders on inadequate salaries and allowances, accommodation, uniforms, and body armor. Our policemen did not drop from the sky. They are members of this society. And it is what you give, you take. Why must we have the kind of police? Why would they perform better outside? Virtually all the DPOs in Lagos State are sleeping in their office. They live practically in their office. So, what is the comfort they are benefiting from? Housing for this number of police personnel has also been a huge task. The Assistant Inspector General of Police 
in charge of cooperative, explains that currently over 2,500 units out of over 20,000 housing units spread across the country have already been allocated. The cooperative society undertake a lot of housing projects, affordable housing, housing projects for all the police personnel in the country. We do that by sometimes developing estates afresh from the exception up to construction and then uh, allocation to, to policemen. And also sometimes you buy outright from developers and at uh, a reasonable price and then allocate to policemen. As we start to come down to the situation, we are we think of barracks to post of the division. Have an idea of the extra officers in that division. Have, have an idea of the number of officers in that number. And put up a functional barrack that can take care of the, those of them who are working in that division that time. As the police personnel receive their first 20% increment in salary in the coming days, the Inspector General of Police and Supervising Ministry and Commission may have to also intervene on the issue of barracks rehabilitation for optimum performance by these operatives. Peace may have finally been restored between two neighboring communities in Taraba State over ownership rights of the fish pond in Marmi community in Lao local government area of the state. It follows the intervention of the state government, which is now taking over the pond in contention. For more than 30 years, this deserted fish pond in Marmi community of Lao local government area in Taraba State has been a bone of contention between the Jolly and Shomo communities. While the battle for right of ownership raged on, dozens of lives were lost and properties worth millions of naira were destroyed in the clashes between the two communities. This crisis started since 1992 when Reverend Jolly was a governor. And subsequently, when Nambaba came in, he tried his best to resolve the crisis. Life has gone. Properties worth millions have destroyed. There was no solution. To nip the age long protracted bloodletting in the bud, the present administration set up an eight man judicial panel of inquiry in September 2020 to identify the remote causes of the crisis and uncover those sponsoring the violence. To identify the remote and immediate causes of the crisis and uncover those involved in the mastermind of the crisis. Two, identify the communities affected and the impact of damage caused, including lives and property. 18 months down the line, the Judicial Panel of Inquiry concludes its findings and submits the white paper to the state government. The deputy governor has gathered the feuding communities to announce decisions taken by the administration. Government approved the takeover of Marmi Fish Farm. Number two, government also approved the management of the farm by a committee to be chaired by the Permanent Secretary Minister of Agriculture and Natural Resources with five other members. Other recommendations include boundary demarcation between the two communities, construction of security outposts, as well as health centers, classrooms, and return of properties taken over forcefully. In the coming days, representatives of the two warring communities are expected to sign a peace accord to ensure that harmony is sustained in the communities. When the news of 10 returns, Governor Dave Umahi says Nigeria's next president must be divinely enthroned for peace and development to reign in the land. Do join us again. Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on Channel's television, Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. 
Bandits kill 11 persons in a fresh attack on Zangal Kataf local government area of Kaduna state. One soldier killed, two critically injured from an ambush by gunmen on a team of soldiers at the boundary between Asarituru and Emoa local government areas of River State. Federal government assures that the recent designation of bandits as terrorists is to end the insecurity challenge in the country. British Foreign Secretary Liz Truss says British troops will not be deployed to fight in any conflict in spite of real threats of Russia invading Ukraine. And Rafael Nadal wins the record 21st Grand Slam, fighting back from two sets down to beat Russia's Daniel Medvedev in a classic Australian Open final. Politics now for Nigeria to experience peace and development. A country's next president must be divinely enthroned. So says presidential hopeful and Ebony state governor, Dave Umahi. He says to this during a church service at the government house chapel in the state capital, Abakaliki, today. Governor Umahi also promised the people that he will not interfere with the process that will lead to the election of the next governor of the state. The seat of the presidency is such that if God does not send you this time, it will be very terrible. Everybody that is of the spirit knows that there is trouble everywhere. But it's God assured mercy. And God told me that this is the last time that selfish leaders will merge in this state. Those who will merge in 2023, those who will serve here, those who will serve at the national level, will be the people that God will anoint himself, and they will have love for the people of this state. They will have love for the unity. No more fighting. Those from Abuja fighting here, those from here fighting. God is going to put an end to it. And so, God is going to search the integrity of our hearts. And that's what God told me. And so, if God searches, and, they, and that's why I'm not going to get involved in any of the offices. I may get only involved in the local government. I have to be honest before the altar of God. But the rest, I will not get involved. An infrastructure development repair work is ongoing on the Apapa outbound, outbound section of the Marine Bridge in Lagos since it was closed on Monday, January 17th, just as the Lagos state government also commenced the rehabilitation and upgrade of Babajide Sowolu Road in Agigi. Channels Television visited these areas to assess the scope of work to be done on the two critical roads and how they're affecting vehicular movement. A sunny afternoon on the Marine Bridge in Lagos, and motorists are having a smooth drive in and out of Apapa. The traffic situation doesn't give any cause for concern despite the partial closure of the Apapa-bound segment of the bridge. Work has been going on since the section was closed for repairs. The scope of the work involves the replacement of the damaged bearings, worn-out expansion joints, and resurfacing. According to the Federal Controller of Works in Lagos, the rehabilitation is a continuation of the project that started in October 2019. The project will have been completed, but because of a paucity of funds, we have achieved about 66 percent uh, percentage. So we have less than 40 to complete. By the time we finish this segment of 300 meters, we must have achieved about 75% completion. So by June, July, we will be off this place. There's been an easy flow of vehicular movement on alternative routes provided to ease traffic outbound Apapa. Lighter vehicles are allowed to descend towards Total under bridge and make use of fire service road to connect Marine Beach. 
The Federal Ministry of Works is also working with security and traffic agencies to ensure traffic flows easily along the axis. It appears official and not having a tough time controlling traffic since it's not a total closure. Until this gridlock caused by the breakdown of a heavy-duty vehicle. We deployed uh, about 100 men to work with uh, LASMA along that MPA Apapa corridor. So what we just did was to do a kind of detachment. It's an extension now, a detachment of some of our men to that spot. Another road earmarked for rehabilitation and upgrade is the Babajide Sawolu Road, formerly Dokwemu Road in Agege, an area notorious for high vehicular traffic. Both ends of the two-kilometer single-lane dual carriageway were closed on the night of Friday, January the 21st, and work has since begun with earth excavation for drainage construction. As a result of the closure, alternative routes to and from Iyanoikbaja and Dokwemu are expected to get busier during the period. Extensions built beyond setbacks have been removed as more demolitions continue. Electrical poles are also being adjusted to accommodate the planned expansion and construction of new drainage. Upon completion, the road is expected to impact positively on the human and vehicular movement and the socio-economic activities of the area. However, some residents are gearing up to the challenges on their livelihood. So we're facing a lot of challenge from the road. These bad boys around used to torment us at night, especially at night. So but now government promised us to do it and it has started the work. So we're expecting a very good a very good living at this road and the area of Dokwemu. Because they have pulled down the extension, it has reduced my space. I needed more space because of the nature of the business I do. So it has reduced the space. Before I heard that they were going to close the road, I was thinking of getting another shop closer to this place. The construction work will be executed in three phases. The first phase will focus on the old Ikbaja Road to Adialu Street Junction for three months. The entire project will last for 18 months. President Mahmoud Buhari has signed or signed the 2022 budget on December 31st, 2021. He was, however, displeased with some changes as well as major additions and reductions made by the National Assembly and critical projects in the 2022 budget without justification. In this report, our National Assembly correspondent, Linda Akigbe, examines the persistent concerns about the extent to which the National Assembly can amend the budget. It's been an ongoing debate in the country. Arguments on the limits of the powers of a National Assembly over the nation's budget or the extent to which the federal legislature can amend the budget. This dispute was recently amplified during the signing of the 2022 budget by President Buhari, where he expressed displeasure over the changes to the original budget proposal in the form of outright removals, reductions and increases in the amounts allocated to projects, as well as the introduction of 6,576 new projects into the budget. What we're discussing is a question of some fundamental issues and challenges that need to be resolved at a certain level. So for me, I do not believe that the legislature has no business tinkering with the budget, introducing a few things, just a few things. I also do not believe that they should go ahead and write a new budget altogether, okay? Like almost what they're doing, trying to bring 5,700 and something. President Buhari had forwarded a 16.39 trillion Naira 2022 budget proposal to the National Assembly, who subsequently increased it to 17.1 trillion Naira. The National Assembly increased the nation's budget several times under the Buhari administration and in previous administrations. Some of the budget adjustments were to fund infrastructural projects, accommodate needs of some government agencies, and increase the budget of the National Assembly itself. Dr. Sam Amadi is the Director for Public Policy and Research. 
He says the constitution does not provide clarity on the extent to which the National Assembly should tinker with the budget proposal. National Assembly themselves in the election year want to see more optics of projects they have delivered. Uh, the, uh, especially in this context where the, the presidency is not running again. So the executive has much more commitment to prudence to deliver on economic legacy projects. The National Assembly may be much more motivated to deliver on short-term electorally valuable projects. There are also concerns about the nature of some of the projects which the National Assembly inserts into national budgets. We see a lot of projects that are done up hazardly. And we have seen instances where in the budgetary provision, six blocks of classroom is meant to be to be constructed. But when contractor come to site, four blocks of classroom is being constructed. Keen observers of parliament want this critical arm of government and executive to address the matter of constituency or zonal intervention projects in a less chaotic way. There should be a lot of handshake before budget. So, you know, oftentimes we've talked about uh, interactions between the executive and legislature, uh, the build up to the budget. But it looks like it's not as robust as it ought to be. So, th that kind of interaction means that before the budget is brought to the National Assembly, there are general consensus around what projects that the National Assembly may want to add. The nation is grappling with a huge deficit in the 2022 budget, revenue shortages, and the recent request by the country's national oil company for the sum of 3 trillion naira to fund petroleum subsidy in 2022. Analysts want robust interactions between the executive and the legislature to find solutions to these problems and build consensus before the next budget is presented to the National Assembly. Linda Akibi, Channels Television News. In another development, the Social Economic Rights and Accountability Project, SERA, pursued the president over what the group describes as his failure to probe allegations that over 3 billion naira of public funds is missing from the Federal Ministry of Finance. The rights group says its action follows an an allegation by the Office of the Auditor General of the Federation in the 2018 and 2019 annual audited reports, the 3.1 billion naira of public funds is missing, misappropriated or unaccounted for. Serap is asking the court to compel the president to prosecute those suspected culprits and recover any of the missing public funds. Serap is also arguing that failure to act amounts to a fundamental breach of national anti-corruption laws and that the country's and the country's international obligations against corruption. When the news at 10 returns, Rafael Nadal wins uh, 21st uh, Grand Slam fighting back from two sets down to beat Russia's Daniel Medvedev in a classic Australian Open final. We'll have that in sports news. Join us again. Welcome back. We're in Kogi State now where the governor, Yahya Bello, is calling on Nigerian youth to acquire entrepreneurial skills in order to be self-reliant and become employers of labor. He says the era when Nigerian graduates wait endlessly for white-collar jobs is over. He calls on youth to toe the line of entrepreneurship to earn income and inspire others to follow suit. The governor was speaking during the sixth convocation ceremony of the Prince Abubakar Audu University, Aingba, in Kogi State. It's the combined convocation ceremony of the Prince Abubakar Audu University, Anyuba, Kogi State, and Governor Yahaya Bello, who is the guest of Anna, joins the procession into the auditorium. Some federal and state legislators, as well as traditional rulers, top government functionaries, academic scholars and captain of industries are attending the event. The pro-chancellor and chairman of the governing council of the university, Professor Ibrahim Abdul Aguye, urges the staff of the institution to redouble their efforts in sustaining academic excellence as he commends Governor Yahya Bello's commitment to the welfare of the students and staff of the institution. The visitor, His Excellency Alaji, Yaya Bello 
has been very supportive of both management and council. He has matched his promises with actions. The highlight of the occasion is the conferment of honorary doctorate degree on Governor Yahya Bello for his developmental strides in education in Kogi State. I confer on you the degree of Doctor of Public Finance, Honoris Causa, of the Prince Aubakar Audi University, Ainda. Congratulations. Delivering the keynote address, Governor Yahya Bele urges the graduates to learn from the leadership skills as well as property, accountability and transparency of the current administration to enable them fix the challenges in the country. I want my fellow younger generation to be inspired by what we do here, by ensuring that we equally develop other younger ones to take over from us. Earlier, Governor Yaya Belo had commissioned some projects, including the one-kilometer road within the campus named after him, the Malam Adamu Adamu Education Complex, which was named after the Minister of Education, cashew nut processing plants, and an entrepreneurial skill acquisition workshop. Well, staying with the theme as access to white-collar jobs continue to be major threats globally, some residents of Potiskom Local Government Council in Yobe State say about 13,000 of citizens depend largely on truck business, thereby contributing to the state's internally generated revenue. In this special report, Channel Television examines the business, which consists of trailer body construction, painting, selling of spare parts, as well as loading and offloading of goods, which is stemming unemployment in the area. This is Potiskum, the most populous town and commercial nerve center of Yobe State. It has the largest livestock market in Nigeria. Both the young and old are engaged in trailer body construction, selling of spare parts, and transportation of goods and services to other parts of the country. When the attack is the according to the the yara motor, the sepia driver, muna halaka, the muta ni sama the dubu go masha uku. Wana sana amuli in kanamu, what and the alala chalaka sami graduate, what and the basakasa. Mutung Takas Ko Taraba, Wasi and the Sana Kuerwa, a Jami or Gashua, Was Sana Kuerwa, a Jami or Dama Turu, Tested Gamma, one and do good money, none do you want Chilaka Sam with a Gawanda, Siki Secondary School, Nesikazo, Aiki, Was Sana Primary School, Sikazo, Aiki, Zua and Juma Madaka, and Mosa Karasa, the Santa Humakaranta. To boost the economy of the state, in July of 2020, the state government, in partnership with the Nigerian Shippers Council, embarked on the construction of a modern trailer park that will create jobs for about 5,000 residents. You can imagine if directly people, 5,000 people are employed. Remember, they will have to eat. Somebody is going to provide the food. And that provides a ready market for the food vendor or the restaurant or the cafeteria or whatsoever. Mechanics has to be there, the welders, car wash, hotels, hospital, fire service, police station, and other small, small shops that people will, will be going there to do their business every day. The park is have a total of 2,000 parking spaces. Plans are underway to create two warehouses, a plaza, a police station, a clinic, wash bays, and a firefighting unit. The construction company gives an update on the project. We, uh, we are starting uh, starting work for uh, screening and ties. Uh, we almost we don't finish uh, three facilities, and we enter to another facilities. Uh, the work done uh, past 70 percent. As the people of Potiskum look forward to when the project will be completed, they are optimistic that its completion would open up Yobe State to more economic activities. The guest lecturer at a public lecture held in Adamawa State on food security, Professor Usman Ta, is urging the Nigerian government to win the hearts of people by solving problems of insurgency in the Northeast. He says the country needs a policy on alternative dispute resolution instead of kinetic approach in tackling insecurity and, by extension, food insecurity. In Nigeria, Food security continues to generate attention, especially with the continuous hike in food prices. 
personalities from the academia, officials of the Adama state government, and other key players are gathered here at the Modibo Adama University to give an assessment of the situation and proffer solutions. Vice Chancellor of the University, Professor Human Tuko, introduced the guest lecturer who delivered the paper on food security, key issues, and policy recommendations. If we are to solve the problem of insurgency in the Nordis, which I have established is the root cause. If you knock off insurgency, the Nordis will re, you know, regain its balance in a very short time. We need to, as a nation, look into our policy, if any, on winning hearts and minds. That is the potential of non-kinetic approach. As discussed earlier, the use of kinetic approach in ending insurgency in Nordis has not yet yielded the much expected result. Consequently, there is need to pursue counterinsurgency through constructive engagement. The guests say the lecture is timely. This is a very important issue, especially in sub-Saharan Africa and Nigeria, where we have uh, a lot of uh, conflicts, conflicts that involve the insurgents like the Boko Haram, ISIS, uh, farmer, uh, hardest clash the climate issues or the environmental issue. You know, this lecture is important in the sense that it connects well to what the lecturer is recommending for good governance. How can we calibrate dialogue? How do we open up uh, 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 opportunities for people to talk, those who are fighting? the insurgents, the government, uh, the, the community people, the leaders, were to begin to have a conversation around how we can well, bring reconcile uh, uh, within ourselves and uh, bring peace and uh, pursue the path of peace. For the participants, one of the key takeaways from the lecture is that the military alone cannot solve the problem of insurgency without the country addressing policy issues that deals with the consequences of insurgency and its impact on agriculture. The Nigerian Navy has reiterated its commitment to ensuring a robust civil military cooperation geared towards winning the heart of the civil populace and supporting security agencies in the fight against crime in the country. The Chief of Naval Staff, Rear Admiral Awal Gambo, disclosed this during the donation of educational materials to some selected schools in Nbaitoli local government area of Imo State. The Nigerian Navy, led by Chief of Naval Staff, Rear Admiral Awagambo, who was represented by Samuel Ochakbo, is here at Imbitoli local government area of Imo State to donate educational material to selected secondary and primary schools in Umonoha community as part of the Navy's objective of cementing the civil military cooperation and relations, especially in communities where they operate. The donations include magnetic white boards, board markers, writing materials to at least five schools in the area. The Chief of Naval Staff, represented by the Command Education Officer, Central Naval Command, Yanagoa, Samuel Otekbo, speaks on the importance of the donations. It is important to note that significant resources have been committed to deliver this civil military cooperation initiative. It is my hope that these gestures of the Nigerian Navy will contribute to overall drive to win the hearts and mind of the civil populace. I therefore appeal for your support and cooperation with the armed forces and security agencies in the fight against insecurity and crimes in our dear nation. The principal of one of the beneficiary schools commends the Nigerian Navy for their magnanimity in the gesture, as he says it will help to build capacity and create an enabling environment for learning. Today's occasion is an effort-making event. This is a realistic proof of the Nigerian Navy's commitment to civil military cooperation, bracket open, CIMIC in Nigeria, bracket closes. The efforts of the Nigerian Navy in supporting and promoting learning activities in our schools and generally the development of education throughout the country is very significant and highly commendable. The Nigerian Navy also commissioned the newly built solar-powered water system and public conveniences courtesy the Nigerian Navy. In similar vein, the Nigerian Army 34 Artillery Brigade Obinze in Imo State has flagged off activities to mark the year's West Africa social activities, which is aimed at building good and robust civil military relationship. West African social activities is an age-long military tradition 
inherited from generations before us, starting from the era of the West African Frontier Force. Available records indicate that the social activity was organized by units and formations in the past to celebrate feats and successes recorded in military operations. Troops also used this opportunity to interact and socialize with families and friends. It's hoped that these gestures will boost the confidence of the public in the Nigerian military and foster partnerships and relationships between the military and civilians across the country. Operators of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency have arrested three trans-border drug traffickers while trying to smuggle 48,000 tablets of tramadol through Mubi in Adamawa State of the Republic of Cameroon. They were arrested at a Samia Junction with exhibits hidden in the packets of another drug. On interrogation, the suspects claimed the drugs were being taken to Bagira Town along Nigeria-Cameroon border to be delivered to some Cameroonians for onward delivery. In other raids, over 1,500 kilograms of imported loud and other illicit substances have been intercepted in Lagos and in Edo states. Officers of the agency also intercepted a consignment of 22 international passports of six different countries hidden in a bag of gari, amongst other food items, at the Murtala Mohammed International Airport in Lagos. And now to the arts. Nine Gems is a solo exhibition by contemporary artist Shegun Akano in Lagos. The over 10 works of art displayed were all done with screws, capturing cultural and social issues the artist is passionate about. Our tribute tonight shows these subjects and interpretations in the solo show. Hearts, one screw at a time, is what Shegwa Ko is doing through his latest solo exhibition. What initiated the works, really, it's our background, our stories as Nigerians, our, our, our fathers, our great grandfathers' stories, their ethics, their, their, their values, um, the things that sustain them, you know. And all before we all became lawyers, doctors, and all that, those are the things our fathers did back then. Those are the things they believed in, you know. We had um, the, the hunters, the uh, onidiris, the, 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 the fishermen, and all that. So it's, it's a way of documenting our stories, taking us back to our roots. Using this unconventional material, this artist has added more color schemes to his traditional themes, which are captured in nine gems. Each of the works takes him about two to three months to accomplish one. And uh, the one thing I like about his style is the unique way, the storyline about the works, like the one at my far right uh, left here, uh, Taito Paki Oton, is about um, a reputable hero, a hunter from Obomosho that was passing through the bushes and he was, you know, in the process of killing animals, hunting animals, he, he, he discovered that no matter how much animal he was able to kill, there is still more animals to come. He was doing this, you know, trying to explore until he finally discovered there are people living in that area. And from that moment, that place was named in he explains how this technique has evolved over time with different elements which he has infused to make it more attractive. I call it um, screw hats. It's um, screw on board. It's a uh, two-dimensional. It's not on the run form, uh, so, but you say enjoy all the forms, you know, uh, uh, those shapes and all that. So it's uh, basically screw on board. Some uh, have... Um, the background with dyed paper, some have auto-based background, you know, so um, some have acrylics on them, some are painted with acrylics, some are just in the natural from the, the screw, 
level of the school. The 2008 graduate of analytical chemistry from the Laduki Akintola University of Technology, Oyo State, has surely left his signature at the Signature Beyond Gallery with this latest collection. Beyond our shores now, NATO says it will not be deploying troops to Ukraine if Russia invades because the country is not a member of the bloc. A comment comes as British Foreign Secretary Liz Truss says British troops will not be deployed to Ukraine either. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg was responding to a question during a TV interview when he said NATO had no plans to deploy combat troops to Ukraine. We have no plans to deploy NATO combat troops uh, to Ukraine. Uh, uh, NATO allies have trainers there. We help them uh, from NATO with uh, building capacity, uh, modernizing their defenses, including their cyber defenses. Uh, uh, NATO allies also provide equipment, uh, defensive weapons, like the UK has now provided, for instance, uh, anti-tank weapons, so we do a lot of stuff to help Ukraine. Uh, he also emphasized the limits of NATO's partnership with Ukraine, to, to stating that the security guarantees again, that an attack Ukraine on one ally will trigger a response from the whole alliance does not apply to Ukraine, uh, since it is not a NATO ally. Yeah. Earlier today, the UK's Foreign Secretary, Liz Truss, had warned that it was unlikely British soldiers would be deployed to fight in any conflict. Instead, she said the UK was sending weapons to Ukraine and strengthened its sanctioned system. So oligarchs close to the Kremlin had nowhere to hide. She said the UK is also offering extra support to nearby NATO allies. Even U.S. President Joe Biden, who had said the U.S. had a standby force of 8,500 troops ready to deploy to Ukraine as soon as Russia invades, said he will be moving U.S. troops to Eastern European and NATO countries in the near term. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has called on NATO to clarify whether it intends to implement key security commitments after Moscow said the alliance's response to its demands did not go far enough. Japan, South Korea and the United States have condemned North Korea after it boasted it had launched its biggest missile since 2017. The weapon was apparently an intermediate range missile which reached an altitude of 2,000 kilometers before coming down in the Sea of Japan. The UN prohibits North Korea from ballistic and nuclear weapons tests and has imposed strict sanctions. January was already one of the busiest months on record for North Korea's missile program with several short-range missiles fired into the sea. South Korea's President Moon Jae-in said the latest flurry of tests was reminiscent of the heightened tensions in 2017, when North Korea conducted several nuclear tests and launched its largest missiles, including some that flew over Japan. Northern Ireland is today remembering those killed today, 50 years ago, when 13 people were shot dead when soldiers opened fire on civil rights demonstrations in Derry. Irish Prime Minister Michael Martin laid a wreath at the memorial ceremony in London, Derry, and said he supported the family's campaign for justice. And today, relatives held a walk of remembrance in memory of the victims. They carried pictures of the victims and children, held white roses as they retraced the steps of the original 1972 Civil Rights March. Soldiers from the Elite Parachute Regiment opened fire on Sunday, January 30, 1972, during a Civil Rights March of the Bauxite Nationalist Area of Londonderry, Northern Ireland. 13 people were killed and 14 wounded on Bloody Sunday, one of whom died later. The British government in 2010 apologized for the unjustified and unjustifiable killings of the Catholic civil rights protesters. Rafael Nadal has made tennis history earlier today by winning the Australian Open for his 21st Grand Slam title, moving one ahead of big three rivals Roger Federer and Novak Djokovic on the men's all-time list. Here's how it played out at the Rod Lava Arena. 
And in the AFCON matches, Mohamed Salah inspired Egypt to place in the Africa Cup of Nations semi-finals as the record seven-time champions came from behind to defeat Morocco 2-1 in extra time in Yaoundé earlier today. Sofiane Bufal's early penalty put Morocco in front of the last eight tie, but skipper Salah equalized for Egypt early in the second half and then made the winner for Mahmoud Trezgo in 10 minutes into extra time. Egypt will play host Cameroon in the semi-finals at the Olimbe Stadium in Yaoundé on Thursday. Sadio Mane Senegal marched on to the semi-finals of the Africa Cup of Nations after seeing off a spirited Equatorial Guinea with a 3-1 victory in their last eight tie in Yaoundé. Back home, Rivers United maintained top spots in the Nigeria Professional Football League following a one-all draw against their hosts, Remos Stars of Ikene, or in Ikene, beg your pardon, in match day nine clash. Andy Ope gave the home team the lead on 10 minutes, while Chidoke Akuneto leveled scores for Rivers United two minutes before the break. Reigning champions, Aqua United beat Niger Tornadoes away with Leo Ezekiel, netting the winning goal in the 66th minute. Former champions Plata United beat Abia Warriors 1-0 in Joss. In other matches, shooting stars defeated MFM 1-0 at the Agige Stadium in a Southwest derby. Quara United beat Gombe United 2-0. Wiki Torres also defeated Nasara United by same scoreline. Manchester United have said forward Mason Greenwood will not train or play for the Premier League club until further notice after being accused of assaulting a woman. The allegations, including video, photographs and a voice note, were posted on Instagram this morning and later deleted. Greenwood has six goals and two assists in 24 matches in all competitions for United this season. The 20-year-old began his career at United's academy and has played once for the England national team. Finally, fireworks lit up the sky over China's capital, Beijing, earlier today. There it is. And a rehearsal ahead of the opening ceremony for the Winter Olympics. Heavy snow fell as the display illuminated the National Stadium, also known as the Bird's Nest, where the ceremony will be held. The Games will open on February 4th. news again. Bandits today killed 11 people in a fresh attack on Zangul Kataf local government area of Kaduda state. Also today, one soldier was killed with two others critically injured from an ambush by gunmen on a team of soldiers at the boundary between Asaruturu and Imohua local government areas of River State. Rafael Nadal today became the first male tennis player to win a record 21 Grand Slams after fighting back from two sets down to beat Russia's Daniel Medvedev in a classic Australian Open final. That's it on the news at 10 tonight. Thanks for watching. I am Amarachi Ubani from all of us here. It's good night.